Here is the million dollar question. Why does Putin want open war in Ukraine? Or at least, why does Putin want NATO to think he wants a war in Ukraine? It might seem obvious, but I'm sure that many of you would not know how to answer. Think of it this way. Russia is in a really bad place. With the way things are at the moment, you could say that they've been in an economic crisis since the invasion of Crimea. And that happened in 2014. When we say economic crisis, think of a real debacle with episodes close to hyperinflation. On top of all of this, we have to add economic sanctions, which are still in place. And the fact that entering into an open war with Ukraine would mean losing almost all of its gas clients. On Visual Politic, we have talked a thousand times about Europe's dependence on Russian gas. But there is another side to this dependence. Europe is also Russia's best customer. It is not much good at having huge gas reserves if you can't sell any of it. And finally, the icing on the cake, the coronavirus. Even though Russia brought out the Sputnik V vaccine, its economy has also suffered due to the pandemic. In other words, the Russian economy is not in any condition to face a lot of risks. But then again, why Ukraine? What could Putin possibly gain by controlling Ukraine? Natural resources? Yeah, there's not much in that country. Wealth? Companies? Not at all. Ukraine is the poorest country in Europe. Put another way, wouldn't Putin be better to focus on his own country? In recent days, you've no doubt heard all kinds of bizarre explanations. Some go as far as to compare Putin to the protagonist of a Venezuelan soap opera. One of those jealous men who tells his ex-wife, if I can't have you, nobody will. But let's be clear, international politics is a lot more complex than all of this. Make no mistake, here on Visual Politic, we're not exactly Putin fans. Yes, it's true that at some point we've used him as a channel mascot or even made jokes about him. But basically anyone who knows us knows that we're essentially anti-Putin. Now, that doesn't mean that he's anyone's puppet. So in this video, we're going to explain Russia's narrative and what the real reasons are for justifying a possible war. And we're going to do it because, editorial line aside, we're independent. This channel is not funded by anyone other than our patrons and our advertisers. Not all channels can say the same. By the way, if you want to be an active part of the Visual Politic community and want to support this project, I remind you that we have our Patreon program. Not only can you collaborate with this project to keep it independent, but you will also receive exclusive gifts such as merchandising and our political analysis newsletter. If you're interested, you can find the links in the description below. But let's stick to our story, because the question we are asking today is, what is Russia's interest in Ukraine? Are its reasons for risking essentially a war really legitimate? What is Vladimir Putin really concerned about? Today, we're going to answer all of these questions, but first, let's look at some history. The Great Russian Nation Have you ever wondered where the word Russia comes from? Well, it comes from ancient Rus, which was a federation of tribes, mainly Slavic. And where do you think the capital of this was? Moscow? St. Petersburg? Well, no, the capital was in Kiev, in today's Ukraine. In other words, you could say that the first Russians in history mostly came from the territory currently known as Ukraine. Ancient Rus became the largest state in all of Europe. However, in the 13th century, the Mongols, under the command of Batu Khan, destroyed this federation. But why are we going so far back in time? Well, for two reasons. First, because it is important for us to understand the role that Ukraine plays in the Russian identity. In fact, everything I am telling you now is literally taken from Vladimir Putin's speeches. By the way, if any Ukrainian feels offended or thinks I'm spreading some historical inaccuracy, this is just a Russian narrative. The second reason we're going so far back in time is because we have to understand that Ukraine, as a national entity, is a very young country. I mean, the territory that Ukraine now occupies has been populated by all sorts of ethnicities and has been part of all sorts of empires. In fact, the very name Ukraine comes from Okarina, which in rolled Russian means periphery. To give you an idea, in 1569, a good part of this territory belonged to the Commonwealth of Lithuania. That's right. These days, Lithuania is a relatively small country, but in those years, Lithuania encompassed almost all of Poland and part of Ukraine. That explains why the nobility and elites were Catholic. However, the Crimea, in contrast, was mostly Muslim. It was occupied by the famous Tartars, which, by the way, has nothing to do with Tartar sauce, just in case you were thinking of Googling that. However, at least according to the Russian narrative, the common people in these lands spoke Russian and professed the Orthodox faith. Mainly, 
Finally, the Cossacks. The Cossacks were just one of the many ethnic groups living here, and they became increasingly fed up with the Lithuanian Polish nobility. That is how war broke out against Lithuania. And that is how, in 1686, Kiev come under Cossack control. The whole area controlled by the Cossacks was called Malorossia, that is, Little Russia. The Cossacks were integrated into the Russian nobility, and for centuries, thousands of Ukrainians emigrated to Russia as if it were part of their own homeland. To give you an idea, one of the leading novelists of Russian culture is Nicholas Gogol. He wrote in Russian all his life, but he was born in today's Ukraine. But hold on just a minute, because we're already in the 20th century and there is still no national entity that we can call Ukraine. In fact, after the Bolshevik Revolution, the map looked like this. As you can see, there is a part that did belong to the Soviet Union. But there were still regions within Poland and others within the former Czechoslovakia. In fact, when the Soviet Union was created, the Republic of Donetsk wanted to be part of the Russian Republic. It was Lenin who decided that it should become part of the new Democratic Republic of Ukraine, which in turn was within the Soviet Union. In other words, the Ukraine we know today emerged after the Second World War. That is when Russia decided that part of the conquered territories should become Ukrainian territory and not Russian. And why? may you ask, didn't they want Russia to be bigger? Well, the truth is that, at the time, the border between Russia and Ukraine mattered very little. I mean, think about it. Both countries were part of the Soviet Union. Both were controlled by Moscow. Both had Russian culture and traditions. Both shared the same Slavic blood. Everything else was incidental. However, in 1991, Ukraine became independent. Russia was not in the least amused by this. According to the Soviet narrative, it was Russia that regrouped different ethnicities and regions and unified them around a single national concept. Suddenly, after all this had happened, the Ukrainians had come along and decided to become independent. Well, how could that be? The problem, the problem is, is that this same argument could be applied to an infinite number of countries that had been colonized. Did India exist before the British arrived? Obviously not. Before British colonization, the territory of India and Pakistan was a mishmash of kingdoms and tribes. Suddenly, the British arrived, sorry, and unified everything into one colony. Years later, the inhabitants of that colony became independent, but they maintained the same colonial borders. The same could be said of almost any Latin American country. However, I doubt there are many who would justify Spain's claim to Colombia at this point in time. But the question, the real question here is, is Putin really so concerned about historical reasons? Well, no, he's not. And we're going to take a look at that right now. What really matters? Russia is afraid that NATO will place ballistic missiles aimed at its border. Worse, Russia is afraid that NATO will place nuclear warheads aimed at Moscow. Really? You say? But NATO already has nuclear warheads. And yes, you are right. Both NATO and Russia have nuclear arsenals and ballistic missiles pointed at each other. Now, it is not the same to have ballistic missiles in West Germany, 2,000 kilometers away from Moscow, as it is to have one on the Ukrainian border, which is 700 kilometers away. In other words, Russia does not want NATO to have member countries on its border. But don't think that the Russians are poor little victims of NATO. They have a gigantic military base in Kaliningrad, which borders Poland and Lithuania. And you can probably imagine what could be nestling in there. We also have to remember one very important thing. NATO is a military alliance created for the purpose of defense against the Soviet Union. That is, Russia is its number one antagonist. Of course, in the 1990s, they signed a kind of peace declaration and promised that they would never do military exercises near Russia. However, since then, NATO has not stopped expanding eastward. In 1999, Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic joined. In 2004, the Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia and Slovenia joined. In other words, NATO is getting closer and closer to Russia. From the Kremlin's point of view, this is a betrayal and an aggressive maneuver. Of course, from NATO's point of view, the story is quite different. It's all these countries who voluntarily decided to join the Union. And it is quite logical that they would want to be part of NATO. They are all countries that were invaded by the Soviet Union and wanted to escape Russian influence. It is logical that they want the protection of the United States and the rest of the European countries. That explains why all official buildings in Lithuania, for example, have NATO flags next to their national and European flags. And you will say, aren't they exaggerating a bit? Why are they so afraid of Russia? If the fear of a possible Russian invasion might have seemed exaggerated, in 2014, Putin proved that it was very real. Yes, visual politic fans, 2014 was the year that Putin invaded the Crimean Peninsula and supported separatists in eastern Ukraine. And he did it because, quite simply, Ukraine wanted to make a free trade pact with the European Union.
So what was Ukraine's reaction? Well, in a way, you could say that Russia has lost a lot in this invasion. We're not only talking about sanctions on the Russian economy. Support for NATO has skyrocketed in almost all of Ukraine. Ukrainians do not want to hear about Russia, except those who live in the eastern regions. That is the so-called Donbass. And now, the question that many of you may be asking yourselves is, why now, in 2022, does Putin want to beat the war drums again? Why now? Well, check this out. Caught with his pants down. Russia has stationed more than 100,000 troops armed to the teeth on the Ukrainian border. There are even tanks. They have been in the area since autumn 2021. To give you an idea, this is a quarter of the entire Ukrainian army. As we've seen in previous visual politic videos, Ukraine is not capable of withstanding a full-scale Russian attack. Yes, it's true. Since 2014, Ukraine's military has been modernized. They now have US weaponry and training. What was once a corrupt army that didn't even have resources to clothe all the soldiers these days is something much more serious. Yet, without NATO reinforcement, it is almost impossible for them to withstand a full-scale attack. For the moment, troops have hardly been mobilized. And it's not clear that all NATO members are willing to do so. So Russia has taken advantage of the situation to write its letter to Santa Claus. That's right. In December 2021, the Russian embassy presented its demands to the White House. That is, its conditions to start negotiating a hypothetical withdrawal of troops. And what can I say? It is certainly a letter to Santa. That is to say, a series of requests that are practically unthinkable. Among other things, Russia demands that NATO should not accept any new members. They also demand that NATO should no longer conduct exercises in Eastern countries. In other words, Russia wants to tell a number of sovereign states what they can and cannot do with their own armies within their own national borders. But not only that, Russia only wants to negotiate with the United States. In other words, they take for granted that NATO is not an interlocker. And the rest of all the European states that are part of the alliance do not have the slightest interest for Putin. Although this is something we will talk about in future videos, because I already anticipate that the topic of Ukraine is going to generate many videos here on Visual Politic. If you don't want to miss them, subscribe and click on the little bell down there to be notified when we upload. But Let's get back to our story. Because now the question is, what exactly is Putin hoping for with these demands? Think about it. This is a gamble like few others. Basically, Russia is demonstrating that it is willing to attack Ukraine in whole or in part. Not only that, it is demonstrating that it has the resources to do so. And it is making totally extreme demands to sit down and negotiate. The question is, is this a pretext to justify a war? Well. We don't have that answer, but it's difficult to imagine. Russia is not interested in an open war. Could this be a way to test how far NATO is willing to go? This hypothesis makes more sense. Perhaps it could serve to improve its negotiating posture. Think of it this way. It makes no sense for Russia to want to invade all of Ukraine. Half of the country would revolt against the invader and it would be a long and tedious war of attrition. And you know how long and tedious wars of attrition end. If not, just ask Biden about his experience in Afghanistan. However, it would not be unreasonable to think that Putin wants to split Ukraine in two. That is, the eastern regions, the so-called Donbass, became a satellite republic of Russia. Considering that the majority of the population in these places is Russian-speaking, this is not really a far-fetched idea. On the other hand, it would not be the first time Ukraine redraws its borders again. But this is all speculation. So now, it's over to you. Do you think we will see an open war in Ukraine? Will we see a new map of Ukraine with the Donetsk and Luhansk republics being an independent country? Or do you think that NATO may be able to stop Vladimir Putin? You can leave me your answer in the comments below. And as always, don't forget that here at Visual Politic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we know. And I'll see you next time.